Good afternoon to our audience in EMEA, and good morning to those of you, the Americas. My name is Eric Fishkin, and I'll be the host for today's webinar titled, How to Generate Better Investment Ideas with Media Sentiment and News Analytics. We'll be covering how to leverage alternative data amid economic volatility, trends in media sentiment analysis, select customer research uses of media sentiment in asset markets, and how to leverage sentiment in this COVID-impacted time. I'm joined today by three standout speakers with varied backgrounds, spanning academia, asset management, and global financial data. Our agenda will begin with a presentation by Dr. Svetlana Borkova, Head of Quantitative Modeling at Probability and Partners, who will discuss how sentiment indicators where various news and internet sources climb sharply the market plummet. And looking forward, she just teaches us how screen, how screen companies are attuned they are to take advantage of the societal changes that are resulting this, from this pandemic. After that, I'll switch from host to presenter. From my role as Proposition Director for Quantum Feeds and Affinitives, handling news and other unstructured text, I'll present one of the most established data sets in the quantum data science community for leveraging text, news analytics. We'll look at best practices as well as various use cases involving this data set and in conjunction with others, spanning live client use and professional research. We expect the first two sessions to complete around the half hour mark. Then we'll have a Q&A session with Ryan LaFond, Deputy CIO of Algerid Global. He'll be interviewed by my colleague, David Aubuchon, Director of Market Development, Quant Data Feeds and Repetitives. The topic there will be how asset management and the use of alternative data have changed in this new environment and what strategies are working best now. Finally, with the time remaining, there will be an audience Q&A with our speaker panel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Svetlana Borovkova. Dr. Borovkova serves as Associate Professor at the Free University of Amsterdam and is Head of Quantitative Modeling and Probability and Partners. Dr. Borovkova has specialized in applying mathematical and statistical methods to problems within quantitative finance and risk management. Dr. Borovkova's research extends in many areas, such as news analytics for finance, derivatives pricing, commodity markets, and risk management in the face of new regulation. She's also a consultant for the Dutch Central Bank and the founder of the Financial Risk Consultancy Data Decisions. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Borovkova, you may now begin. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, how we uh, at Probability and Partners use alternative data for um, monitoring um, stress in the financial markets of different varieties ranging from the global markets such as S&P 500 down to sectors or economies. And I'm going to touch on emerging post-corona trends which we see and uh, how um, your investment portfolio can be kind of tilted towards companies that are more resilient uh, to, to those trends. Uh, but I'd like to begin with a polling question, uh, just to get a feeling for how people uh, experience the combination of the current sort of stress period and uh, their openness to the alternative data. And by alternative data, I, I mean everything uh, ranging from sentiment, satellite, imaging, um, whatever you can think of. Uh, so my question to you is, since the coronavirus crisis, has your willingness to use alternative data, A, increased, B, decreased, C, stayed the same, I already was using it routinely, or D, stayed the same, I was and remain skeptical uh, about it. So, could you please vote uh, on those uh, polling questions? So, since the coronavirus crisis, when you um, work from home, when you much more uh, open to internet resources, your willingness to use alternative data increased, decreased, stayed the same because you were already using it, or stayed the same because you were and remained skeptical about it. So I'll give you a few more seconds to vote, and then we will see. Yeah. Okay, so this is your last chance. A, B, C, or D. Uh, let's see what uh, what we get. Uh, great. I see that um, majority of uh, attendees say that uh, your willingness to use alternative data increased. And that's really good to hear. Um, and as we will see in a minute, the, one of the 
let's say, post-corona trends is indeed uh, increased openness to digitalization and hence, uh, hopefully, uh, embracement of alternative data. Um, right. Thank you very much for that. Anyway, so when we uh, talk about alternative data, um, my personal interest is very much in the field of sentiment uh, analysis, sentiment news and social media. But of course, there is also uh, other sources of alternative data, such as Google and other internet searches, which I will mention a little bit today as well. Uh, sustainability scores of firms, referred also often as ESG, and a whole multitude of others. But these three are predominantly the ones that I'm going to uh, touch on. So we, um, using um, uh, uh, Refinitiv uh, News Analytics, uh, which is a powerful uh, natural language processing uh, uh, engine, which reads and interprets news related to many, many companies um, and all commodities. Um, so we use the, um, this, uh, we, we use this data to uh, aggregate uh, those sentiment signals into sentiments over, let's say, um, American uh, stock market or European stock market or FTSE or Asian uh, stock markets or maybe different sectors. Uh, and um, we come up with so-called uh, PSI, sentiment indices, which we uh, monitor uh, continuously. And so uh, what we have seen um, is that since uh, sometime in the mid-January, S&P 500 sentiment, which is indicated here as a blue line, has shown a rapid and sustained decline. Uh, you see, at that point in time, nothing was happening to the S&P 500 price as a whole, which is the yellow line. And yet the dramatic decline, which was uh, kind of ongoing, uh, really attracted our attention. So this is the, the blue line is the sentiment, aggregated sentiment over all companies in S&P 500. And it's constructed uh, using uh, Refinitiv News Analytics and our proprietary methodology. Um, ask me about it if you want to know more, but I will not go into detail uh, right now. Uh, think of it as a general sort of media sentiment about US stock market as a whole. So we um, suspect that ha that might have something to do with the coronavirus, which of course by then, back then was not uh, yet um, or even on the agenda. So we published a LinkedIn blog on February 21, so one month after we have seen that decline. And um, we also had a look at the mentions of COVID, coronavirus in the news uh, since January. And Indeed, the mentions of uh, COVID-related terms were shooting up uh, at that point in time. Uh, so probably it had something to do with coronavirus. However, to construct the sentiment, there is no terms related to coronavirus uh, at all. So this is just the overall sentiment of how markets uh, see the chances of, uh, let's say, uh, large cap US stocks. And so this was uh, mid-February, and only uh, later the prices started tumbling uh, together with sentiment uh, in sync. And so, as you can see, there was a huge delay between the price reaction and the sentiment reaction, uh, which is, by the way, something which uh, we observed already many times ago in the past, that sentiment in, tr in times of distress precedes price movements by by a long time, can be three months. Uh, in this particular case, it was about three to four weeks. Um, so in that, that makes sentiment really an excellent stress indicator, which uh, precedes um, price movements. So you, as you see, then the prices and sentiment started tumbling down together in sync. And this is um, how the situation is right now. So here I plotted actually the sentiment over a longer period of time, just to show you just how dramatic is that coronavirus-related dip 
it's something that we have never seen before. So this is a sentiment for the last, let's say, three years. But if you go back last almost 20 years, there is nothing as serious as this, also not at times of the global financial crisis. So as you can see that the uh, sentiment recovered quite uh, significantly. And uh, so monitoring this uh, right now also is uh, very, very interesting and useful for, um, especially if you are what sort of into the global asset allocation. Um, right, so, um, so this is one thing we can do. We can aggregate sentiment about many different companies into an indicator which tells us the temperature of the financial market as a whole, US, U, or maybe even global. What we can also do, we can look at um, which uh, emerging trends we can identify. And uh, also at the height of the coronavirus crisis, we start thinking about that, um, how the world is going to look like um, after, or well, uh, when things calm down a little bit and using uh, things like sentiment but also uh, activity of people we basically in uh, trends which were uh, of course not the only ones but the most prominent ones as you as uh, uh, as we could see and these three trends we can call let's say social transformation um well if you want to be negative you can call it social fear it is accelerated digitalization uh, and sustainable innovation. And um, uh, I think about a month ago, uh, Refinitiv had an interesting uh, week-long discussion about uh, these emerging trends on LinkedIn. And we were happy to see that indeed these three trends were very much confirmed by the participants. But using uh, alternative data, we could see the emergence of, that tr of those trends already very much um, earlier, let's say March and April, when, um, uh, you know, we still didn't know where we were and uh, where the world was going. So what kind of signals that you can, you can look at? So here, for example, you can see travel related Google searches. And um, so the, um, these are Google trends. And you see that travel related searches plunged uh, dramatically after uh, especially uh, World uh, Health Organization declared COVID-19 uh, global pandemic, um, uh, changing our ideas about, uh, you know, freedom of travel, all we are about being uh, in enclosed spaces with other people and moving ourselves from A to B. Um, so uh, food services related. So for example, here you can see um, the uh, home delivery uh, Google related searches, also recipes, uh, things like that, um, which uh, also indicate interest in, let's say, staying and buying local um, rather than, again, finding ourselves in uh, a very crowded sort of social situation. So these are the kind of trends, uh, the, the, these are the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, points that um, underline that first trend that I was talking about, the social social fear or social transformation. So as I said, it's a cautionness in travel, mass gatherings, interest in staying and buying local, but also other things uh, such as uh, level of hygiene and higher priority towards healthcare. So for example, the higher priority towards healthcare, you could also see very well uh, looking by certain persons um, related to healthcare companies. So looking for, um, um, IT, let's say security, but also web conference related uh, Google searches, you see also this gigantic spike in, um, in those things, um, searching for web services, uh, web conferences, and also uh, giving an increased attention to IT security, which um, uh, also things um, like having an entertainment or even um, exercise uh, things basically online. Um, so these are YouTube searches um, for online exercise, again, spiking dramatically uh, um, at the uh, moment when most uh, Western countries introduced lockdown measures. 
and so on. Uh, again, looking for a particular search terms or uh, terms in the social media, you can see that uh, the accelerated digitalization trend is characterized by those uh, those uh, things such as uh, digitalization of work services, but also recreation, moving meetings and conference online, something we are doing uh, right now. Uh, broader acceptance of online solutions, including alternative data, as we just saw from the poll question, and of course, uh, very uh, increased importance of IT security. And finally, um, so, um, uh, sustainable innovation, uh, finding its way into our day-to-day -day life, also probably on the back of the coronavirus crisis. And you can see it uh, by energy-related um, Google searches. So these are the solar uh, power, um, whether it has to do with home improvement people were undertaking during the coronavirus pandemic or um, simply increased interest in uh, sustainable solutions. But um, all this indicates that uh, sustainability is basically finding its way onto the mainstream agenda rather than just being kind of a niche uh, thing. And uh, one of the things um, why is why that is happening is uh, because um, government support um, to businesses, uh, um, you know, uh, affected by coronavirus. Um, is very much conditioned on sustainable transformation. You can look at the support to airlines and other um, other companies where um, the condition of receiving that uh, government support is transforming your ways of operation into the sustainable fashion. Another thing is, of course, a changing balance between customers versus shareholder interest, deglobalization, which I already mentioned, and shift from growth oriented to a circular economy uh, demand for sustainable products. So uh, by now we kind of uh, all feel these uh, trends uh, sort of gaining momentum, but uh, alternative data basically could help you um, sort of isolate them uh, pretty early on. And so now you can basically um, try to score uh, investment opportunities according to uh, their uh, resistance to these, uh, to these uh, trends. So uh, using alternative data against sentiment, uh, particularly companies can be scored in terms of those trends. And of course, ESG um, uh, scores, ESG data is also very uh, helpful, in, particularly at the last uh, uh, trend. So these trends can be thought of as new investment factors and portfolios can be tilted towards these new factors. And uh, what I want to emphasize that this actually goes beyond simple sector selection. So of course, the no brainer would be to invest in tech and health care, you know, and uh, let everything else basically uh, drop. But of course, you want to have a, a balanced and diversified portfolio. So really you want to choose companies from each and every sector that are resistant to uh, to those trends rather than just uh, having a huge sector tilt which uh, you know basically goes at cost of diversification so let me co uh, show you a couple of examples of the scoring procedure um, let me let me look uh, let's look at the company such as Nike so you can score it basically according to those three trends you know the social fear um, uh, digitalization and, uh, and sustainability. So, for example, the uh, the, the 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 red means um, sort of less resistant to a particular trend, and green is more resistant. So, here, for example, we scored it uh, red in terms of social fear uh, because of absence of sport events, mass gatherings, um, and so on. However, for example, it scores really well in terms of sustainability. Uh, climate-related projects, and so on. So let's uh, look at another company. So here is, for example, Danone. Um, and Danone uh, scores uh, very highly on all three of those trends um, in terms of uh, social fear or social transformation. It's uh, affecting Danone in a positive way at uh, two particular situations. For 
purchasing of more uh, packaged foods, uh, but also uh, they have the health um, sort of healthy lines which are um, are going to benefit uh, from from uh, from this trend. Um, again, carbon neutrality is a big uh, thing for Danone, making it score highly on the um, sustainable transformation, and so on. So you can score um, companies in that way. Uh, so these are just a couple of examples, and uh, choose those that, let's say, score well on let's several of those uh, of those trends. Um, another thing uh, I'd like to mention is how did more sustainable firms uh, feared coronavirus crisis? So here we uh, plotted the um, uh, accumulated uh, returns, so most of the time it was losses, of more versus less sustainable firms during the coronavirus crisis. So really from, uh, let's say, uh, February until uh, May. So really just uh, uh, for a few months when uh, everything was uh, basically very unstable. And we rank the firms basically according to their uh, ESG uh, scores, uh, Refinitiv ESG scores. And what you can basically see is that uh, here on this uh, top left graph, these are the more sustainable firms versus less sustainable, and the losses that they suffered during this crisis are uh, significantly lower um, than for the less sustainable firms. And that comes particularly from the G, from the governance component, which is bottom right graph uh, showing you know, top and bottom ranked uh, firms in terms of the G score. Um, so this is a very, very uh, sort of uh, bird, bird flight view. And uh, you can do uh, similar things per sector, per um, country, uh, per different ESG aspect to see, you know, what uh, distinguishes uh, more uh, from less sustainable firms. And what we actually see is that this is particularly true for energy and utility firms. So those who are more sustainable have much less volatile uh, performance during these stress times. But that actually holds true for uh, across the board. Um, again, I'm just going very, very quickly, but if you want to know more, um, please ask me or um, get in touch because we have very uh, many interesting things to share with you on also this. Um, um. Anyway, so uh, just to summarize what I was saying is that alternative data, in particular sentiment signals, are excellent risk indicators. And um, they are excellent risk indicators both from the perspective of the markets as a whole, down to sectors and down to individual companies. So the granularity of this risk uh, uh, signal um, doesn't matter for it being able to signal uh, significant times of distress, whether it's for uh, financial markets, for particular sectors, or for com individual sector, individual companies. Uh, alternative data can help us identify upcoming trends and uh, companies' projections on those trends. And uh, as a result, we can immunize uh, investment portfolios um, towards uh, those uh, post-corona trends. So this is just very briefly uh, our findings. As I said, please feel free to get in touch and uh, uh, if you want to know more and uh, also to discuss how we can help you uh, with many of those issues. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. I think back to you. Thank you, Dr. Borovkova, for a fascinating presentation. It's interesting to consider how different alternative data sets really shine in different market regimes. It wouldn't surprise me if there are some data scientists in their audience who are contemplating which would be most useful to create scores around social transformation, accelerated digitalization, sustainable innovation, and how to rate companies in, a, in an innovative universe in a scalable way. Yeah, that would be very, very useful. Um, clearly, we can exchange ideas about it, but I think that, uh, you know, those explicit projections towards those trends uh, and measuring that is really something which would be great because at the moment it's a very much qualitative assessment. 
uh, of course, with alternative data, but I think quantification of it would be would be a very, very useful tool. Hmm. So transitioning to our next presentation, one alternative data set that Refinev has present, provided for over a decade, long enough that it might not even be considered alternative data anymore, is news. Leveraging our exclusive arrangement to provide word as news into the Finnish community, Refinev machine readable news analytics turns unstructured market moving news to structured quant ready text analytics. Again, my name is Eric Fishkin, and I currently serve as the proposition director of Refinitive handling the unstructured text and machine real machine readable news businesses. Our provi products provide not only the raw text, but also the tag and the metadata, and the more advanced NLP based data such as sentiment, emotions, and topics. Before we get started, I want to poll the audience. Um, what is the most important use of news and social media in your investing strategies? Do you use it casually? Is you just read it during the day? Are you an avid reader? Is it a component in your qual models? Or are you not really using it at all? It just doesn't really factor into it. Please vote. And it looks like about half, this is a very um, quant-oriented group. Nearly half of you are using a component in quant models. Uh, some are not using it, and others are, the rest of you are using it reading. So about 50-50, either using quant models, or we have some reliance on it for our daily reading use. Um, so today, what I'd like to talk about is news analytics. First what it is and how to extract value out of it. And then we'll look at five uses of news analytics. We'll start from the most uh, narrow trading period from intraday, and move to graduate to longer impacts and trading horizons. We'll have one client use of news analytics to start. We'll go through four of the uses uh, that come from Refinitiv's internal Starmite quantitative research team. A couple of them are actually around earnings releases. So product overview. So news analytics is, um, it quantifies unstructured news text along a core set of measures. The most, most important one is probably sentiment. Sentiment denotes the tone of the item, how positive, neutral, or new negative or neutral it is toward a given company, given the text used in the article. And then other metrics are used as filing. So relevance, how important is it to the, to the document? Novelty, is this old news? And then we have volume count, which is the trailing count of news on a company. This is useful to see when you see when news volume on account accelerates, on a company accelerates, then you might see a, uh, increased volatility in trading volume. Then there are other measures that can add filtering, such as flagship market commentary. And again, one of the linchpins of this, of this product is not just the NLP, but also the underlying content. It starts with the word is news, with approximately 2,500 journalists in nearly 200 locations. They're renowned for global coverage and for news for news breaks. See wordisbest.com for more, for highlight exclusives. Now, in terms of using it, like other quant data sets, you really have to know the underlying content. I'll go through this quickly, but one of the most important distinctions is really around the difference between Reuters news and the other kinds of other kinds of news stories. Uh, Reuters news, for example, can develop. Well, third-party releases tend to be more atomic. It could be a press release or regulatory release. Reuters news, interestingly, also for the desk because it's built in many ways for a desktop user as most of the urgent information comes out first, and that might be the most pertinent to trade on an intraday la layer, versus articles that come out later that have more completeness and might be better used in, say, an end-of-day model. It's important to know how to sp spot market-moving information and use the metadata that comes with the topic code tags, tags for companies. You want to match the data to your horizon. As I mentioned, some of the, the, some of the facts and the alerts might be more useful intraday but the article's opinions may be better for slower entries or exits, maybe in the end of the day or every week or once a month. And then finally, it's important to know that sentiment is not end-all be-all. There are other facts that come out of it, such as price target changes. In some cases, these are appropriate to use as proxies for sentiment. And then, of course, you have to know your source as well in the underlying level. Word is news because they have measures for objectivity as a goal. They tend to be more objective whereas press releases tend to skew positive. So 
So as a result, you want to, if you're going to use them together, you're going to want to account for the, the natural bias in press release. Now, in terms of using the data, you know, we generally have clients who take the positive, neutral, negative scores. They combine into a positive, minus, and negative, and that sentiment. They might give a weight to a high neutral score. Then they'll, they'll filter for high relevance. And again, you know, like adding in a filter, the higher, the, the more stringent the filter, the higher the quality of the data, but the reach will be compromised. And then you'll look for novelty count. You look for news items that had no more than zero or one similar news items in a trailing window. And you want to omit the low impact market news items, such as market commentary, trading alerts, and you want, may want to give extra emphasis in your model to earnings and M&A, which naturally are the most important kinds of news releases. So now I'd like to ask the audience another question. For those, especially for about half of those that are using news in their quant models, what do you see as the greatest impediment to using news in social media quant models? Have you, has it been that you've, you've had issues with that doing, to, you've been looking at the raw text and there have been problems with the natural language pro processing? Has it been the problems with actually getting a hold of a, real, of a high quality archive, historical corpus? Or is it lack of efficacy in your trading horizon? That perhaps you're trying, you've been using, using some metrics for news intended for a slower trading, a, a smaller trading horizon and having trouble adapting to a longer trading horizon. Let's see what the audience has to say about this. And it's kind of been a mix. Uh, some of you clearly seem to be working with the textual news, and the issue has been really dealing with the natural energy processing, you know, the tools, the resources. Um, in other words, it's just, you know, not working, maybe collecting on their own, but it's very difficult, very difficult to get along at a consistent corpus. So what I'd like to talk about today are five use cases. We'll start with one that is um, from one of our clients, Zuho, and their target universe is topics of red stocks. They released a press release about three years ago, and put, using an existing data sets with equity data, FX, price volume data, commodity futures, and also corporate governance data, they're looking to predict top 500 stocks intraday about 30 to 60 minutes out. A few years ago, they purchased these analytics. They're still clients of ours, and they're looking to, they've been looking to enhance their, their, their models. Okay? Now we're going to look at one that goes from, the not intraday, day, but goes from the close to the open. And that is using new sentiment from these analytics, as well as social media buzz from another product of ours, the market like in disease. The idea, so we start on the left, and we see this is the, for these, this, uh, this group of stocks, this universe, that up to 4 p.m., when there was no pre-market news the next day, as expected, the open was approximately the close. However, when there was news before the open, the, when the sentiment is overall positive, according to, of course, the filters, that the sentiment is about the, the, the difference is about 100 basis points up or 100 basis points down, depending on the sentiment. Now, another thing to think about is how many people are reading this? How important is the market, how much does the market value this news? And what we look at is to look at the social media buzz for markets like indices. Markets like indices is measuring about 800 social media sites, financial sites, and we see that in a, if we compare the pre-market media buzz in the markets like indices for that company, when it's above the 21-day moving average, either that the effect from the sentiment seems to be about double. It's about 200 basis points up and about 200 basis points down. And when it's very high, when it's about 10x the average trailing media, 200 for social media buzz, it tends to be about double that, up to about 400 basis points up and down. So interesting, a way you can pair two, diff very diff two similar looking but very different content sets, news and social media. Okay, now we'll look at, we'll go past, because past single day and end of day, and we'll look at the effect with post-earnings announcement drift. As many of you know, the post-earnings announcement drift 
the concept that prices drift long after an earnings surprise. We, and this is anomalous to the efficient market hypothesis because that hypothesis would, would posit that prices should adjust instantly with the release of surprising earnings data. In fact, there is a drift. So we see, and this is a paper we released a few years ago and we recently updated, that the drift you'll see in the, the dim blue and the red lines, according for a positive surprise and negative surprise against the IBIS estimate. However, when the market sentiment is negative and there's a positive surprise, or when the market sentiment is positive and there's a negative surprise, you see the dark lines that the drift that the drift is much more pronounced and much longer. Another example, we'll talk now finally a couple of examples and we'll look at this in context of smarter earnings estimates. We'll look at the smart Starlight Smart estimate. This takes the IBIS EPS current consensus estimate. And it adds two common sense enhancements. One is it gives more weight to recent annual revision, and then less to older and possibly stale estimates. It also gives more weight to analysts with better track records. And so if we then combine, compare the SMART estimate with, with the, IBIS, the IBIS estimate, we get what we call as predicted surprise. And this is expressed as a percent change against the SMART estimate. So for example, if the IBIS estimate was a dollar earning and the SMART estimate was $1.10, the predicted surprise would be 10%. Now, a couple, couple interesting uh, results from that we found from this. One is that when the sentiment event is in the same direction as the predicted surprise, the anticipated revisions occur more quickly and more often. On the left chart, we see a case where the predicted surprise is negative. On the right, where the predicted surprise is positive. Uh, the gray line in the middle is when a news event comes out, but irrespective of any sentiment. However, when we look at we look at negative news, top decile negative news, um, we see that the, the, the percent increases occur much more quickly. And when it's positive news against negative price surprise, they, have, they go down. The, percent of, the speed of the, of the revisions goes down. And then the same on the other side. Whether you have positive news and positive surprise, those revisions happen more quickly. Finally, not only does it does, it, does news analytics help to predict the analyst revision? It actually helps predict the earnings surprise. And that is when the trailing sentiment leads you up to the earnings release in the same direction as the predicted surprise, an actual earnings surprise is more likely. So if we compare here, that when there's a negative predicted surprise, so a predicted surprise of negative 2% or lower, that unconditioned gets right about 54% of the time. When it's positive, it's correct about two thirds of the time. However, when we layer in trailing news analytic, trailing news sentiment for that company, we find that those, those, percent, those percents go up quite a bit, especially as you go into the top decile. So finally, just summarizing up, high quality media sources provide facts and opinions that markets respond to. News analytics are designed to provide quantitative measures to help clients work with unstructured data, but to get the most out of it, you really still have to know the underlying data, just like any other data set. And then finally, client use and, and research, either definitive research as well as third-party research, shows utility over various holding periods when combined with other data sets. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you found this thought-provoking. I'm now going to turn this over to my colleague, David Aubuchon. David serves as Director of Market Development, Quant and Data Feeds, and Definitive. He's responsible for the commercial interest of Infinitive's quant data feed, the business of the Americas. He started his journey with Thompson Reuters and Infinitive over 10 years ago. He's joined today by Ryan LaFon, Deputy CIO of Aldred Global. Prior to rejoining Aldred Global, Ryan was head of research for the Asia Pacific and Emerging Markets Equity Group within BlackRock's scientific academic activity team. Ryan began his career as a persistent professor at the MIT School and School of Management. He earned an MBA a BBA degree, and a PhD with a concentration in accounting, both from the University of Wisconsin. Ryan has spent a good deal of his career working with unstructured and alternative data, so I'm really looking forward to hearing the practitioner's view. David, Ryan, take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. Um, Ryan, I told him I wasn't going to go through your story credentials, but I guess Eric went ahead and did that for us. Um, but <laughs> thanks again for, uh, for joining us. Um, you know, I think... You know, really to set the background, obviously, 
yourself in particular and Algar in general have been working with sentiment and LP technology for a decade, and I think 15 years or so in your personal experience. Um, maybe to start, I think, and we've heard from um, Svetlana and, and Eric about some applications of the technology, but maybe if you could give us a sense of how you've seen uh, the practice of applying sentiment, the use of NLP in the investment management space evolve um, over the time period that you've interacted with this. Um, and maybe, you know, if we think about the two components of technology versus the content used um, with the technology, mm -hmm. maybe we start with the technology side first and how you've seen that come along and impact the landscape. Yeah, I mean, you know, I still remember going back, I would say, to do a lot of stuff 10, 15 years ago, you really did need kind of like a large team because you had to kind of build everything yourself. There wasn't a lot of machine readable text out there. Um, you had to deal with a lot of different formats, you know, how scanned PDFs, PDFs, you know, uh, not much in terms of even some of the HTML content. And really what's changed over the past, you know, five or so years has been one, the access to the, just an increase in access to machine readable text and really the technology in terms of what some of the off the shelf things, whether it be like Python's NLTK package or some of the things that you can do in R. And so what's really, I think it happened over the past few years is that it's shifted from something of a, you needed a big team to do this because it was just messy and dirty and you needed lots of processing power to really use now, um, you know, you can go and download some packages, uh, some open source packages off the web. There's a lot more machine readable text and you can be up and running in some of these things in the span of, you know, a couple of, you know, days or weeks. And what's nice about that is I think it's turned it back in front of this, what I would call a technology arms race to really more of a race about ideas and how you're applying some of those ideas. Uh, Which I think is like an interesting, I mean, if we go back to the polling question and people suggested one of the reasons why they have yet to really dive into um, sentiment or tech, uh, NLP space is because of the lack of tools. But I think probably objectively speaking, it's there's way more tools and it's way more simple to get into the space now than certainly it was five, 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned, um, you know, the content availability increasing, um, you know, Svetlana walked through a couple of kind of the emerging trends. And I, I think about the use of sentiment over the course of the last 10 years, I guess, predominantly being the case. Um, and then those 10 years, we've had a largely kind of one way trending bull market, more or less. And I'm curious in the, in the current more volatile environment, certainly um, tripped up by coronavirus, if you've seen any changes in the application of sentiment, anything that you've noticed um, is either makes it easier or harder to rely on um, as a result of volatility in today's markets. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you've seen in some of the, the prior presentations pointed out is just the um, a pretty dramatic shift down in the, the kind of aggregate mean. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of different sources of sentiment, um, whether they're from the sell side, whether they're from the company, whether they're from uh, news sources, typically you observe a pretty positive um, kind of bias or mean in that data. Since coronavirus, the mean has definitely shifted down, but there's still kind of substantial, you know, cross-sectional variation. The other uh, thing that I think is probably more interesting for somebody like myself that does a lot more of the stock selection is we've seen things like you know i think about you know half the firms in the u.s pulled their guidance uh, the south side community in general has kind of responded being as that guidance been pulled and some of the typical sources of information has been pulled we've seen you know a slowdown in analyst revisions uh and kind of some of those more traditional sources of like sentiment whereas what you've seen with the news features and particularly um whether it be from the companies, whether it be from reporters, whether um, sentiment from conference calls, we've seen a continued flow and updating in kind of these uh, non-traditional sources of information. So the one thing that I would say since coronavirus has happened is many of these, uh, you know, text-based sentiment indicators have been much faster to incorporate some of the new corona-related information or just new information in general than what you've seen from some of the, I would say, more traditional 
you know, analyst revision and analyst kind of uh, recommendation type measures. So I, I guess it kind of makes me think when you talk about um, the the emergence or the change in tone, right? Um, one interesting thing that we've been seeing a little bit of an uptick on recently here at Refinitiv has been the interest in the evaluation of audio evaluation as opposed to strictly text evaluation of content as it relates to sentiment. I know it's kind of a little bit on the cutting edge, or at least there's not a, a, a ton of uh, third parties or, or people that are really diving into it um, extensively, but I'm curious your maybe early thoughts on the ability to use that, or is that something that we're kind of early days on, or do you think there's a pretty good indication that that's a good complementary data set to use along with the text content? So I think uh, all of the audio there is just all about speed. Um, you know, I, one of the other big changes we've seen in many of these sentiment indicators, particularly some of the simpler constructs, news-based sentiment, and some of the, I'd say, off-the-shelf based dictionaries is that they've gotten substantially faster over time as they've become more accessible, you've seen more investors incorporating this type of information. And so the logical kind of conclusion there is to get faster. And how do you do that? Well, if I have to wait a minute after the call to get the transcript, um, well, I can get ahead of that if I start processing uh, the audio information. And so I think that's what it's all about uh, on there is that it's just kind of, gets you ahead of some of the people that might be processing similar information using uh, the actual transcript. I don't think in the call what we've seen is anything beyond that. And what we found in some of our research is that, uh, you know, sentiment has gotten quicker. You can get a faster view of sentiment using audio. If you want to play the, what I would call like technology arms race of, you know, fast off the shelf sentiment indicators, it's probably a good thing, but, uh, there's not much there beyond that. And I think one of the big reasons for that is in most conference calls, most of the content, particularly prepared remarks, is actually pre-recorded. And so the only place where you really can do some of the more behavioral features on there is within the, the question and answer section. And even that, it's pretty limited, um, kind of the advantage of doing that in audio versus doing that off of a transcript. That's an interesting observation. I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of academic research talking about um, the applicability of that. We definitely have seen the number of startups enter the space and, and try to create products around it. Um, it. It's interesting. I've seen, um, I think a lot of that's been a pivot of um, these companies starting on how to train C-suites on how to not give away stuff um, yeah. and <laughs> over the audio and then conversely then taking it to the street to suggest that to the extent that they are giving away something, maybe there's something to pick up in the audio. So um, kind of interesting way that, that that might evolve a little bit. Um, you know, going back a minute, you mentioned that, you know, the new democratization, I guess, of the technology and, and the increase of content availability has allowed more people to get into the space. But I presume that's not, you know, necessarily where investment manager is going to spend a lot of time adding value to it, right? If you're just using off the shelf, tools, mm -hmm. right? You're probably, you're not going to be able to differentiate your technology or your, your signals that you're generating on the back of it. Um, what do you think, you know, whether it be specific to Alger or asset managers in general, how do you guys think about how you um, add your secret sauce or the, the, the benefit that you guys bring in the analysis of text relative to some of the tools off the shelf that you might get? Yeah, I mean, I think for on most all these things, I think it's where you look for what you process and how you process it. It's all kind of mixing that together and to be your special sauce. I mean, to give you a little bit of, of the example in that, we're big proponents of always kind of building our own dictionaries, doing a lot of curation around those dictionaries when we're doing bag of words based approaches. A lot of the motivation behind that is, you know, we think our experience and expertise gives us some edge in what to look for. Uh, the other, you know, features, you know, to add to kind of our secret sauce is, you know, if you look at something like news analytics um, and various news scores, there's a lot of value to be gained in the kind of selection of what news stories to score. Uh, most news stories are 
in general, like if you look at a, you know, like Tesla, for example, had their conference call last night. There's going to be a variety of news stories out about them today. Not all those news stories are really new information. It's just, you know, paper A reporting the same events that paper B reported a little bit sooner. And so, you know, in creating some secret sauce around, you know, various new sentiment type indicators beyond, you know, differentiated dictionaries and differentiated features is really, you know, that initial selecting of what you should, you know, which stories you want to score and which stories you want to ignore. I think, you know, really like for us, you know, one of the, the big pieces and where we think we add a lot of value is really just having some knowledge and some context about finance and really the firms there, which when you're looking at, you know, something like a regulatory document brings you a lot of advantages because you can kind of say like, you know, I should look in this section for these features. I should expect to see these things in this section. And when I don't see that, uh, that's sometimes very interesting, but I think it's that kind of knowledge and context of, or domain knowledge there in, in addition to the technology and having the technical skills to process that really, you know, ultimately we think is a big advantage. I think the other thing for us too, I'd finally say is, you know, we're big proponents of always building things yourself versus the kind of off the shelf approaches. Um, I think the off the shelf approaches, particularly what we've seen from various, you know, vendors, is that those are the first to get arbitraged away. Uh, they tend to, you know, very nice back test, but out of sample be very, very quick and pretty easily arbitraged away. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, you know, one last thing, and, and you mentioned on a previous chat, um, and it's been a couple, topic of a couple of the questions and answers there that have been submitted during the web, webinar, but. Um, you know, you mentioned a couple times like um, participating in the speed game, right? How whether it be the voice or the speed of the transcripts being released after a call. Um, you know, how how do you view that speed of um, alpha decay? Um, has that changed dramatically over the years? And then, um, do you think you know the effective time period? I think so that Lana mentioned a period of three, four plus weeks that sentiment might pre uh, presage price movement versus is this really an intraday or a couple day game versus is there a way to really think about it from terms of long-term trend analysis for portfolio construction? Yeah. Um, so when it comes to news and just the simple off the shelf news dictionary, particularly within, you know, global mega cap kind of stocks, that's intraday at this point. Um, the there are longer term features uh, that you can extract, but it's you know to extract those you have to go beyond just pulling down you know pick your favorite off the shelf dictionary, whether it be like the Harvard dictionary or some of the various kind of off the shelf finance dictionaries, and run it on all your news stories. Uh, that game has what you that you know five years ago that was pretty interesting you know whereas now you just really can't do that. Uh, most of that is armed very, very quickly. So I think what you see is like you just have to be clever. And that cleverness um, for those that can go in and create unique features and find some of those kind of undiscovered topics within there, uh, whether it be text or conference calls or regulatory filings, there's still longer term alpha to be there that's you know measured in, in terms of months. But I think the idea that I could, you know, take um, pick your favorite, you know, data feed, uh, machine readable text for news sources, throw in the Harvard general, uh, like inquire dictionary and get a sentiment score and have that forecast returns for multiple months. That was interesting five years ago. Now it's just not. Not there anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the insight. I mean, I think, um, What's nice about a webinar like this is, right, you kind of have a blend of, like, the academic, the productization, and then the actual in-practice use case. Um, I think it's always going to be one of those dynamics where there's a bit of the rat race where, you know, <laughs> practitioners like yourself require some of the fire hose of content to be out there in order to be able to run interesting analytics on. Uh, Eric, to his part, is trying to keep up with that, <laughs> that demand and generate new and interesting product sets for the marketplace. And a lot of that, frankly, is um, driven by people like 
that Lana that are coming up with interesting research pieces and white papers and kind of pushing the boundaries of academic research. So um, I do appreciate your input to the conversation. Um, we do have a number of questions that have come in um, that I want to be able to reserve the last five minutes for. Um, Eric, is that okay with you and Svetlana? Absolutely. Perfect. Um, yeah. You know, I guess one question that's come in, and, and maybe this would be a bit of a, an opening question to Svetlana and or Ryan, is um, how do you separate um, data mining and story fitting from true sentiment prediction? Uh, maybe Svetlana, we'll start with you. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the, the question very well. Uh, you see, when we um, uh, take the sentiment, um, you know, which is, you know, large, big data, many sources, many companies, and then we, uh, you know, do our sort of magic with it, aggregate it, and so on, we do not uh, relate it in any way to uh, actual market development. So in that sense, there is no uh, data mining. So, and then afterwards we see, you know, whether there is uh, predictive power in any way. And um, on one hand, I agree with uh, Ryan uh, that, uh, you know, simple prediction is perhaps now, uh, especially on the long term, is gone. But what we still see is that um, in decrease in risk, so using sentiment as risk indicator, uh, is still very, very powerful. So um, at times of distress, sentiment is simply a leading indicator. So uh, I wouldn't call it alpha signal in this way, but it is definitely limiting your downside and limiting the volatility. But I don't um, see that there is any data mining in it because the whole sentiment story is completely separate from the actual price developments and they are related only in the very, very last stage. I mean, maybe I'll just jump in here for a, a second. I think, you know, ultimately it's out of sample. Does it work out of sample? Um, does it work on various kind of holdout samples and other features like that? I do think, you know, when we think about the construct of sentiment, particularly when it, it's text, it does accurately capture that sentiment, um, whether it's positive or negative um, on there. Whether that sentiment feature forecast returns is more where I think you run into the data mining kind of issue. And there, you know, it is a big issue. And this is why out of sample and holdout samples are um, so important. You know, I always like a paper that was put out by Quantopia a while back that basically, you know, showed the risk of their data mining efforts in there, uh, in that, you know, the correlation between out of sample and in sample performance was something I want to say like negative pretty you know 0.8 or something like that i don't recall and then the next slide that the next piece of they showed is that the correlation between out of sample performance and the number of back tests that they ran was also negative um, so clearly you know people were overfitting the data there and this is where that out of sample performance just is so important great thanks guys um you know, another question came in about, you know, I think largely we've been talking about this from like an equity markets view, um, but the idea of applying media sentiment to all other markets like foreign exchange in particular, um, to think about how we um, apply sentiment to, um, you know, the dynamics between Euro, USD, exchange rate, things like that. Um, so, Alana, do you, have you done any research um, following a, other all? Sorry, other asset classes outside the equity space, or is um, equities primarily where you think the applicability most resides? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I'm asked uh, that question uh, quite a lot. So um, interest rates and foreign exchange are difficult uh, markets because they are very uh, influenced by central banks, uh, you know, things like that. And I just rather not touch it with a barge pole to be honest. Um, uh, we did have a look uh, at uh, the relationship between, uh, let's say, media sentiment about uh, big stock markets and, let's say, country um, uh, credit ratings. So that uh, is definitely something which is uh, worth doing. Um, as I said, FX is 
it's hard because it's um, there are all sorts of determinants there that are simply not market driven. Where there is, however, asset class where sentiment work exceptionally well, and that is commodities. Uh, commodities are driven by supply and demand, which is very well captured in um, in news, uh, particularly also perhaps social media a little bit. Uh, but for commodities, um, uh, for commodities, the sentiment analysis is very difficult because um, what sounds positive is negative for the price and other way around. So, you know, like a big oil rig explodes sounds negative, but for the price, it's good for the price of oil. So the sentiment analysis is very hard, but if it's done well, then it, um, it works very well. It, uh, it can really also aid uh, good decisions uh, in terms of commodities uh, trading on different scales, you know, intraday, daily and so on. So I think that would be something worth exploring, especially if you are uh, in that business or as it's part of your portfolio in in those markets. Um, but the interest rates and FX, um, I would uh, think it would be pretty difficult to discern trends of that from news. Gotcha. Perfect. And Ryan, I don't know if you have any last minute thoughts on that or... If you guys, it's not really part of the purview. I mean, we've done some work on it. Uh, it's not typically part of our purview, but we found that there's definitely some interesting things there. And it's a worthwhile area of research. Okay. Well, perfect. Eric, I think that's about all the time we have for Q&A. Um, if we want to tie this one up, I appreciate the uh, time. And Ryan, of course, for your time during the uh, the Q&A here at the end as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, and thank, thanks, yep. Dave, and thanks to um, to Ryan and, and to uh, Svetlana. Uh, this was a great, I think it was a great, well-rounded set of presentations and comments. I hope the audience enjoyed this and found it useful. I'm told that the recording webinar and the decks will be uploaded shortly. If you're seeking more information, I invite you to look at blog posts and refinitive perspectives where you can find some of the research I mentioned today as well as some research from Dr. Borovkova. More information, of course, you can also reach out to your Definitive account manager. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.